for Governor Chris Miller. Good morning, Chris. How are you, sir? I'm good, man. How about yourself? Excellent. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, how goes the campaign? Having an absolute blast. Um, going around the state, talk to as many people as we can. Was in Morgantown yesterday. Going to be in Martinsburg Saturday night, Jefferson County on Sunday. Back at it the next week. It's uh, having a lot of fun doing this. And you are going to be in the Eastern Panhandle this weekend. What's your schedule like here? Well, so I come in for a, a function with the Rotary Club on Saturday evening, and then I'm speaking at the uh, Jefferson County event on Sunday, which is they have their Jefferson County GOP Reagan picnic. And so get to hang out there and meet some people. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right. Will you be here the entire weekend? Uh, yeah. Come in Saturday afternoon and then leave, you know, Sunday around 4 o'clock or so. All right, very good. Chris, what's been the reception for you as you have moved around the state? Obviously, you're well-known in the southern end of the state, but what's it been like for you in the northern end of the state and the eastern panhandle? You know, any any chance I get to talk to a group of people, they're like, I like this guy, he's different. And right now, man, I just think we're in this position where we don't need any more politicians and bureaucrats and attorneys um, running things. We need entrepreneurs and business guys. And I'm just trying to be authentic and talk, you know, from my heart. state's got a major opportunity in front of it. We also have a bunch of financial challenges. And, you know, man, I've got um, 26 different businesses built that over a long period of time. We've got about 700 employees, 500 are inside of the state of West Virginia. And if I ran my businesses the way the government spends our tax dollars, I'd be broke. So, you know, I'm rolling up my sleeves and getting involved, and I'm trying to be real, and I'm trying to be authentic. And our state has a major opportunity in front of it with what we could do understanding the games with power and the utility grid system, we could make West Virginia the state in the union with the cheapest power in the country and drive down the cost of power for our people and use that as the foundation of all of our economic growth and development. And that could be special. That could be something incredible. And you think about how capital flows like water to the places that it's most welcome. If we do that with West Virginia, we get a creative cost advantage and businesses will come to us, and we'll have a thriving economy. And that's how we keep our people here. Because West Virginia, our number one export right now, is not our coal and not our natural gas. It's not our timber. Our number one export are our educated kids. It's our people. And all we have to do is grow the state's economy a little bit to grow the population, and it could put us in a position where we could do something fantastic. Admiral. Yeah. Good morning, Chris. Uh, uh, for the ones of the, for the listening audience that does not, that does not know, uh, your mother represents West Virginia in the first congressional district. So that is correct. Yeah. So uh, going back to exporting uh, uh, power, I assume you're talking about coal and oil. Is that correct? Well, natural gas as well, okay. and there's an incredible amount of water that passes through yeah. the state of West Virginia. There's more water that passes through it than any other state in the country. And when you add all that up, that is baseload power, and the world has to have it. As we grow technology, you have to have power to fuel it. You have to. Yeah. So what would you do uh, that has not been done for the last several, several years? What, what unique approach would you take? Um, run state government more like a business and make ourselves very, very open to investment. We're in a position now where we have to grow our population and have to grow our people because there's a bond rating fiasco coming if we don't. And if you run state government more like a business and promote it and market it the right way to bring the right people in and grow the population, then it's an absolute game changer and it stops the the financial catastrophe that's coming from happening. So like, when I'm talking about running it like a business, you got to realize that capital flows like water to the places that it's most welcome. And we have to do everything that we can to make ourselves appealing to outside investment. And that's how we're going to be able to grow an economy. But right now we wind up cutting special deals with outside groups that are already coming to us because we have what they want. And I've seen it with my own eyes. Politicians and bureaucrats are not good negotiators. They don't cut good deals. And so they leave a lot of meat left on the table. And you know, that is a definite opportunity when it comes to doing something to represent the people. Yeah, not trying to be argumentative, but a lot of candidates at this stage of the campaign say the same thing that you're saying now. We've got to get away from the bureaucratic uh, manipulations. We have to run it like a like a business. Uh, you mentioned one in the negotiation. Are some of the other Pacifics that would set you apart from your predecessors or your your, uh, your competition? 
Yeah. Um, I built a series of businesses and employ a bunch of people. And to do that, you have to understand how the world works and how to, you know, create jobs. I'm the only guy that's run that actually signs, that's running, that's signed the front of a paycheck. And I understand the risks that exist. You know, if I make a living solving the problems that government creates, basically, and if you back into what the real problem is, we've been declining in population every year for the past 40 years. And we have an aging population, and it's creating the perfect storm where eventually it affects our bond rating statewide and dramatically raises the cost of government. And guess what? We don't have a productive tax base below it to justify that big bloated existence. And that's when the deep tailspin and scale back happens. It's going to be ugly. And I started a data company in March of 2020 because I was just curious to see what was going to happen. Anytime throughout history we've had a pandemic, influenza, bubonic plague, Spanish flu, it's all the same thing. And what the trends are telling us what the data tells us is, is that we are in the beginning stages of a demographic shift and it's not as simple as california to texas and new york and new jersey to florida it's ingrained in a bunch of stuff cultural social economic and political and west virginia has based on the data what people are looking for and <clears throat> all you got to do is understand that and then know how to solve the problem and this is not a thought process that politicians go through it's not and example, three of the four fastest growing states post-pandemic, Tennessee, Texas, and Florida, they all have one thing in common, and that is a zero state income tax. One of the absolute first things that we need to do is get rid of the income tax completely and as fast as possible. That is bringing people to those states because this Trump tax cuts got rid of all the SALT deductions. And so it used to be you were able to deduct a bunch of your state-level taxation expenses from your federal ticket before you sent your check in. Well, the rates went down, but those deductions went away. So it makes it even more appealing for people to be located in states with a zero state income tax. Is it fair That's though, just one of the many things yeah. you strive at. Is it fair, Chris, to compare West Virginia to Florida to Tennessee and to California? Because those other three have a large mega tourist attraction, which we do not have in West Virginia. What we do have, though, is what people are looking for, which is hills and trees and rivers and streams and a high quality of life and a low cost of living. And we are abundant with natural resources, all the timber, all the coal, all the natural gas, all the water. I mean, with the resources that we have that the rest of the world needs, we should be one of the richest states in the country. Just the system's wrong because we've been extracted and don't have much to show for it. So you've got to turn that thing up on its end. John? John Gilstra. Uh, good morning. The, um, <clears throat> I hear what you're saying, and, and I am one of the world's great capitalists. I, I think that it's the most perfect economic system that, that we can have. However, a government is not a business. A government is a lot of things. And I think every state has, has elements can be proud of, and every state has things that they are embarrassed by. And I have to say that in West Virginia, if there's something that we should be embarrassed by, it's the education system, where we're spending in the upper 50 percentile of you know, per capita on students, and we're performing down at the very bottom among students. This is a problem we've talked about in the show a number of times, and nobody seems to take ownership of the problem. So as governor, how do we start changing this? You talk about exporting the educated uh, people out of the state. Well, let's start by educating the people in the state. And in, if and nothing else, it seems to me that if, if I'm about, if, if I'm going to relocate my business to West Virginia, I've got to convince my employees that their kids are going to, are going to do well and thrive in an education system. And I don't think we can do that right now. So how do we change it? Well, education and gr like growing a thriving economy and population growth go all hand in hand because if you don't have an education system to keep people here, they're not going to stay or they're not going to come to begin with. So it is very, very important. I think the entire structure of our ed education system is wrong. There is a teacher shortage across the country already. And if you look at the system and go, hmm, how do we solve this? You've got this – West Virginia is in anywhere between 18 and 20 in dollars spent per kid compared to the rest of the states nationally. Yet all the money gets soaked up at the top of this big loaded layer of bureaucracy as opposed to flowing into the classroom to pay our teachers more and to benefit who the real like, customer is, which is the taxpayer. And the focus should be on doing everything that we can to make them better, to make education better. 
And also, you've got to have the right number of teachers to be able to do that. So you flow the money into the classroom to pay the teacher more and make sure the technology and the resources and the services go to interface with the customer, which is the taxpayer, the student, and the, and the parent. And you get rid of a lot of that bloated bureaucracy at the top that sucks up all the resources. That's the first practical thing that I can think of to solve some problems. And then you really have to roll up your sleeves and get to work. So you have to have a focus on providing an excellent quality product. All this while cutting and taxes. Education. Well, listen, there's a lot of work to do, and we're going to have to get creative. Because you want to talk about finances inside of the state. We already have major issues. The Department of Highways has already bonded to the hilt. We can't build more roads. And the road bonds project that we passed, we're only going to be able to complete about two-thirds of it because of the changing interest rates, changing cost of labor, and inflation. And so you're going to have to get creative there. PEIA needs to be relooked at because we've got a lot of people dependent upon that insurance, but guess what? The funding is going to continue to be suck, sucked up out of the budget that is going to have issues in the future. So we've got to get creative. We've got to act now. And I'm a big believer of growing the free market economy and letting transactions occur and letting the free market, like, raise everything else up. And if you do that as well, you bring people here, then you've got more revenue and more resources to be able to provide even more stuff to the people. And at the same time, there's a lot of government that could be, you know, made more efficient. And this is a big job. It's a lot of work. And this is not a job. Like, this is a chief executive office. The governor's, the governor's office is a chief executive. And this is the kind of thought process you have to have to make that whole entity run better. And politicians don't do that. Well, yeah, but it, 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 you're the chief executive, but you're also the um, chief executioner, for lack, for lack of a better term, and yeah. in, in a positive way. So what are, put some meat on the bones. What what would you do? Where do you cut first? How do you, and, and let's, staying on education, if, if we can, what are the, what are the, the, the nails to drive uh, to make, to make that happen? I, I thought I made it pretty clear when it comes to no the in principle more. yeah well you, okay you're talking about paying teachers more but at the same time we're cutting taxes and having the resources flow in the right way see so where where you need to focus on is that big bloated layer on the top that soaks up all the resources that big bureaucracy are we talking about got to work with the legislature to create the right situ right scenarios to then let it happen because like you said a lot of that stuff flows to the legislature you got to work with the legislature so would you. What is the bloated layer? Are we talking the, the um, uh, education? Uh, uh, it's what do we call it? Department of Education. It's all the people that sit around in a building and don't do anything as opposed to interfacing with the customer, which is the taxpayer. It, we need people to do stuff. We need people to work. And it's just this big bloated layer at the top that really doesn't provide a tangible benefit to the taxpayer. How, how would you go about uh, eliminating this bloated area as you describe it? With, well, you'd that. have to work with the legislature. Yeah, you'd have to work with the legislature to find the right, like, opportunities. You, you'd Honestly, I hate this phrase, you have to study it, but you've got to study it. You've got to find the right places that aren't efficient and get rid of them. And that, that just takes work. Yeah. And have you ever heard another person running for office talking about this kind of stuff? Actually, I have. They don't. But they don't ever do anything. Well, that, that's the other question. Uh, they talk about it all the time. They talk about it when they're running. Whether they're able to implement their, their campaign talk is, is a second question altogether. So. Yeah, that's leadership, right? That's yeah. leadership function, and it's you know, a little bit of bravery. You've got to yeah. work hard. Yeah. You've got to work with the legislature. You've got to make stuff happen. And listen, if we, don't, if we don't start acting right now, it gets really, really bad, guys. I, I don't need a job. Right? I've got plenty of those. I'm 44 years old, and I've got three kids, and I've got a wife, and I make a very, very good living working in the private sector, making a big impact in the communities that I'm privileged enough to do business in. And I could keep doing that and having a blast. But, like, this challenge of doing something different and seeing this rare window of opportunity in front of us to really, really roll up my sleeves and get to work, like, that excites me, man. Yeah. And if we're being totally honest, there are even more layers of problems inside of our state that we need to be aware of that are going to take a lot of work to fix. I mean, the opiate epidemic, we're still on the tail end of that, and you can't tell me that doesn't impact education. And, like, as well, we got a foster care system that's dilapidated that needs a lot of serious work. And like, there's serious work that needs to be done. 
Let's, let's get into and, that foster care program, Chris, uh, uh, situation, because, uh, as you mentioned, it's it hasn't been fixed. It just kind of has gone silent for a while. Uh, it, they're trying to address it, especially with the reworking of DHHR, but uh, at this point, I'm still getting information that says uh, foster children are being put up in hotels uh, because of a lack of resources. Can you tell me what you know about this system and what it would take to fix it? And or being shipped out of state. There needs to be a focus on it, one, and we need to do a better job of it. We need to be able to make sure and have a better link of foster parents available. We need to have better systems to take care of these kids, too. And we got to stop them from being shipped out of the state, too, because that is a resource like our kids are our future and i will tell you guys doing what i've done in the private sector for several years now like when you start looking at things from a business perspective like when that pandemic hit for example we sent all these government employees home with laptops to work from home and nobody logged in nobody did anything and still government functioned everything still got paid you can't tell me there's not meat left on that bone and this literally goes into absolutely every facet inside of the government. We have to make it all run more efficient. And if we don't start doing this kind of stuff right now, like I said, there is a bond fiasco coming that is going to be a disaster for West Virginia. And that excites me to be able to actually do that, get involved, help, and roll up my sleeves and do something for other people. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, let's shift uh, for a couple minutes, Chris, about your, you and your campaign. Uh, have you run for elected office before? No, sir. Never so have. this is the first one. Uh, your yeah. your f- familiarity and exposure to the Eastern Panhandle, you're going to be up here tomorrow. Uh, have you been up here quite frequently in the last few, uh, uh, last several months? Well, yeah, a couple of times, um, coming up to meet people, talk to groups. Um, also, I'm a big, big uh, supporter of 4-H and um, cattle, or sorry, county livestock auctions. We go and buy 4-H animals all around the state to help kids that are learning farm work. We're bison farmers, by the way. Got a big bison farm, and so that kind of stuff's really important to me. Been up to the Jefferson County Fair and uh, met a lot of kids up there and helped out a lot of um, kids learning to raise livestock and been to those auctions, so... I have been, and I, I will tell you, the future of the state of West Virginia is in the eastern panhandle. It is a major opportunity for further growth and development. Um, it is located in the exact right location to be able to do that. And it also has, you know, flat land and a lot of resources. Like, that, the eastern panhandle is going to be a huge portion of the success of the future of the state of West Virginia. Part, so of, this, it, it, part of that success, Chris, is based on keeping our people here, and part of that challenge has to do with locality pay of some form or fashion. As a governor, would you yep. support that in the Eastern Panhandle? Absolutely. Next question Absolutely. is, how do you get it implemented? Well, like I said, you've got to work with the legislature and map out an entire vision and set of goals that you want to accomplish and how they all interact. interact. Um, you, you've got to do that for the Eastern Panhandle. Really, you should be trying to do that for lo- all throughout the state of West Virginia because, you know, education, teacher shortage, Got to make sure and bring in the best. Got to have the best in the eastern panhandle. Got to have the best in the south. Got to make sure that the people that are down there already are taken care of. Chris, uh, you've, hey, you've, and, you've kind of filled in the blanks here there about your own story. Could you give us the Chris Miller story for those who are just hearing from you for the first time? Yeah, sure. Um, when I was 10 and a half years old, I told my dad I wanted a pair of Air Jordan tennis shoes. And when he found out they cost $125, he told me to get a job. So I got a paper route and delivered newspapers every day, rain, sleet, or snow for several years. And then my dad bought a farm, and we got into the farming business. And me and my brother did manual labor on a farm every summer for 45 hours a week, making 4 bucks an hour, you know, clearing fields, building barbed wire fence and baling hay. And I'm talking about square bales, right, not those big round bales that people use nowadays and learning how to weld and running heavy equipment, built a big uh, bison corral out of two-inch and three-inch iron pipe. Um, and some of the best times I've ever had in my life have to do with working on a farm and seeing what you produce every single day. Um, was lucky enough to uh, go off to college, got a partial academic scholarship, got a degree in economics, um, married my wife, been married for 20 years, and have three kids, live in Huntington. I've got a 16-year-old boy, a 14-year-old boy, both of them wrestle, play sports, run track. Now we've got a 10-and-a-half-year-old little girl who uh, is a firecracker, and we're all going to wind up working for her one of these days. 
and <clears throat> got two great Danes, big dogs, and enjoy uh, doing everything I can to be a part of the community that I'm privileged enough to do business in. I believe that that is a very, very noble and important thing in being very, very active and giving to the communities that you are able to make a living in. And it's just something that I love doing. Um, I'm also a boxer, um, retired recently because I'm 44 and uh, the old body doesn't heal like it used to. But I still love it, still like to uh, train, but it can't compete anymore. A little too old. I do remember the boxing story the last time we had you on there. <laughs> Go yeah. ahead, Bill. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Chris. And, and I will tell you this, guys, this, this conversation, it has been one of the most in-depth, deep interviews that I've done since I started this process. Mm -hmm. You guys are asking great questions, and I absolutely love it. Let me see if I can add to that. Hopefully it is considered a good question. Uh, the state is very diverse. We all recognize that. Probably more diverse uh, uh, than uh, most states. Uh, you alluded to the eastern panhandle. We do experience a lot of growth here, unlike the rest of the state. So if you're as governor, uh, when Justice came in, his first big push was transportation. He made no bones about it. We had to do something with our roads. If when you come in, the first to first week, what particular, what singular issue would you address that would try to take in mind the diversity on the needs of our state? So backing into that equation, growing an economy and population growth is one of the most important things. First thing I'd probably do, the very first thing would be the income tax. And then I'd start hitting all the singles and the doubles because you got to there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. There's a lot of things that you got to do. Then you got to start prepping for that big picture thing, and that has to do with the power production and the power creation. Because if we make West Virginia the state of the union with the cheapest power in the country, and use that for the foundation of all of our economic growth and development, you're doing two things, right? Businesses will come to us, but more importantly, you think about Jim and Susie Adkins. Both of them are on Social Security. You cut their power bill by 50 to 70 percent, you've done something impactful for their lives, too. The power is going to continue to go up in cost. And so primarily that would be one of the big picture focuses. But to answer your question, income tax straight off the bat and then start learning about everything that I can to make each and every department run more efficiently. And your goal would um, be to eliminate income tax altogether. Is that correct? Yep. Okay, fine. All together. Now, uh, going back to energy production, uh, there's only so much that the governor can do in the short term. Uh, can do a lot for the long term, but in the short term. What would you, what part of the energy equation would you address in the short term, for the short term? Well, <clears throat> you have to work with the utility commissions to make sure and focus on costs. Um, there's a lot of legal precedence as well that puts West Virginia in a rare, rare position. There's some federal legislation about water. There's some Supreme Court cases about energy production inside of the state and start finding the right opportunities to invest in to start producing power here for ourselves. Were you done, Bill? Yeah, I am. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, uh, Chris. Quick, yeah. quick uh, note, to Chris, before we let you go, and that has to do with uh, – a recovery in the state of West Virginia, substance abuse and all the problems with fentanyl and such. How does uh, Governor Miller address those issues? Um, there will never be another governor that's run for West Virginia that understands the opiate epidemic more than me. I've been sober from alcohol and opiates since April 1st of 2004 and know the impact that that has. Been through detox, the works. And I've also been heavily involved in speaking and helping um, facilitate growth inside of the real recovery system because I don't think we get recovery right at all. And the focus should be on rewiring the pathways, the brain of the addict. you got to do that with one-on-one -on -one and group meetings and then also jobs inside of a community and then also rigorous exercise because that's how you get the brain to start firing serotonin and dopamine again. And that would be the primary focus is to make sure and implement the overall holistic approach to recovery to minimize relapse. And we also got to be teaching these people trades. We got to teach them how to do stuff because one of the last, one of the number one reasons for relapse is lack of economic opportunity or economic mobility. And there's a major demand for viable labor and workforce. And we got a whole generation of kids that don't know how to do stuff. Like we need more trades.
in some of the businesses and industries that I've got, we're always looking for people. Always. And we teach people how to do stuff, to actually have trades, something that they can learn to do, that actually every single day can provide a value-added product. That's how you do it. We need more welders. We need more HVAC repairmen. We need more masons. We need more boilermakers. So it's solving problems, and it's doing it creatively, and it's doing it honestly. Chris, on that note, I'll let you get started on your lengthy trip to the Eastern Panhandle and uh, appreciate your appearance on the program today. Where can people find out more about your campaign for governor? Well, you can go to millerforgov.com. Um, got a website there. There's a YouTube page that's connected to it that's got a lot of the videos and uh, speeches I've done. There's a Facebook page, Chris Miller for Governor. And really look forward to meeting as many people as I can and um, earning everybody's vote because that's the thing, right? We're picking a leader. We're picking someone that actually can do something different and run our state. And I'm totally prepared to do that. Chris, thanks so much for your time this morning. Best of luck to you. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it, guys. Safe travels.